And then they asked me some system design interview questions and I just didn't know what to do. I was so confused. I don't know how to scale. I just, I don't know how to scale. System designs are some of the most difficult interview questions that software engineers will be asked during an interviewing process. Now, these questions are really ambiguous. There's not a clear cut answer to any of these questions. And usually you're expected to pivot or have different answers for different situations. Now, more broadly, system design is the practice and method of creating many disparate pieces of software into an entire system. This may be around building a scalable application or building an entire platform. And in my experience interviewing people, system design is probably one of the biggest things that I see people miss. And it's easy, it's really easy to miss this stuff. There's not a lot of great resources online for it, and most of the time people focus on leak code, data structures, algorithms type questions instead of broad, large system architecture questions. And I've even seen junior engineers be asked these type of questions before. And they're really important questions. Systems and software are getting so complicated today. If you just look at Kubernetes, the stack of Kubernetes is like 15 things deep. And you have to be able to know these things if you're gonna be building applications on top of these abstractions. So yes, junior engineers may be asked system design interview questions. Senior engineers will definitely be asked these kind of questions. So I think it's good for everybody to know how to answer them, how to approach them, and some common answers to some of the common questions. And that's what this video is about today. I'm going to be starting a whole series about system design interview questions and hopefully flesh a whole thing out so that it's a one-stop shop for you to go for your system design interview prep. I'm John, this is John Codes, and we're going to be diving deep into system design interviews. So to start off, we're going to just talk about the strategy and some of the biggest concepts that you'll need to know to start studying and getting ready for your system design interviews. So I would say number one, probably the biggest thing is to recognize that this is from a very high level. You are not drilling into the individual algorithms or even the coding part of this. This is from an extremely high level. This is probably the biggest miss that I see when people get into this is they start talking about, say, a database that they're going to have. So here's my database. And then they dive way too deep into the details about what SQL queries they might have or how they might organize the tables, all kinds of things. It is really easy to dive into the nitty gritty, but really hold yourself back. System design interviews are purely about the high level design of systems not about the individual implementation of those things. Next thing I see is you have to be ready to pivot. And what I mean by that is you have to be ready to change directions a little bit. Your interviewer is gonna be continually giving you feedback in this and asking you questions. You may be asking them questions and you have to be prepared to take a different direction than maybe you were thinking about. Say we go back to that database example, and let's say that you were gonna pick a MySQL database for certain reasons. They may ask you, huh, what if we wanted to do this in a non-relational way? What if we wanted to pick something like Mongo? You have to be ready to pivot and you have to be ready to accept that and move forward with some of the different requirements really that they may be giving you for that system. Which really leads me to point number three. This is honestly a conversation. Okay, and what I mean by that is your interviewer is going to be talking with you and giving you feedback and you're going to be talking with them. This also means that you need to clearly be discussing with them your thought process and what you're thinking about for this system that you're designing. And I think this is really important. Probably the most important thing in any software engineering interview that you're going to be doing is you have to be giving them a constant stream of your thought process. People are going to have a really hard time evaluating your engineering ability if you're not letting them into your thought process. And I think that's especially critical in system design interviews, because the moment you don't communicate, then you're not letting them into your assumptions. You're not letting them know about what you're thinking about for that system and what considerations for the future you might be giving that system. So long story short, it's a conversation. You got to talk. You got to let them into your thought process. You got to let it sort of be a stream of consciousness of what you're thinking for that system. Now, next, you have to be ready to talk about trade-offs. 
And I sort of mentioned that a little bit up here where I was talking about MySQL versus Mongo. Maybe the system needs one thing. Maybe the requirements have another thing. And you have to be ready to discuss those trade-offs and discuss what one thing might give us versus another. This is huge. You can't focus too hard on one thing because you need to be able to discuss its trade-offs and what's good about it, what might be bad about it, what may really work well for this system, and what won't work well for this system. And sort of a side point to this, really what system design interviews are all about is scalability. Again, I can't spell well, so if I'm spelling something wrong up in here, I apologize. But really all system design interviews are about is scalability. And you have to be able to talk about the trade-offs in scalability when talking about different pieces of a system that you're considering. If you take anything away from this video, really you should take this away. All system design interviews have to talk about scalability. Again, systems today are so incredibly huge and have to be able to scale to millions and millions of users. You have to be able to talk about that in your system design interview because companies want engineers who know how to scale to large amount of users. That's just the world we live in today. So that sort of leads me into the next point, number five, you have to know the tech. And when I say you have to know the tech, you have to know th about databases. You have to know about caching layers. You have to know about a lot of these different technologies that make up our systems today, because if you don't, then you can't really talk about their trade-offs and you can't really have a conversation about them. And you see what I'm saying? It kind of goes up and up and up. Then you have a hard time pivoting and then you can't really talk about it at a high level, so on and so forth. So do a little bit of research, start to understand some of the different things like maybe in the back end that you need to know about just so that you can talk about them at a high level. I'm not saying you need to become an expert in every database out there possible, but at a very high level, you should know about the various different databases, the very different caching layers, messaging systems, infrastructure things, all that stuff. There will be a separate video where I talk about at a high level, a lot of the tech in system design interviews. That way you too can kind of have a good idea of some of the trade-offs and what these things do and what you should use them for. So this is gonna be a separate video in this series. Great. And then really last but not least is you got to practice. I don't really think that this is something that a lot of software engineers do on a daily basis. I think people are thinking about systems and thinking about how they can implement things into systems. But at a very high level, I don't think a lot of people, a lot of software engineers are thinking about designing high level systems from scratch. So this is just one of those things, just like data structures and algorithms that you got to practice to be well versed at so that when you show up in your interview, you can talk about the tech, you can talk about trade-offs, you can have a conversation. So practice, practice by yourself, get a whiteboard, get something like this with a drawing pen and just practice, practice drawing these things out and talking about them at an extremely high level. So now let's apply those principles and concepts to probably the most typical question you will receive that is scale to 1 million users. How would you go from something super arbitrary, like a single server stack, to something that can scale to millions and millions of concurrent users at the same time? And I think if you can master and understand this one question, then you're already well on the way to understanding the majority of other questions that you might get asked in a system design interview. But those will be for other videos. So let's look how we can scale to 1 million users. Now, to start off, we're just going to have a basic server. Now, this server here could be self-hosted somewhere or somewhere in the cloud, but let's just imagine for now that this is a self-hosted web server that can be accessible from the internet. Now, a user, a single user, can access this server. They can make a web request from mobile or the web on their browser. And that will go out to the World Wide Web. Let's just imagine that this, this is gonna be our DNS. Now DNS will be something for another video, but that will resolve something back to the user. Now this will be a, an IP address. And then the user's browser, web browser, or whatever can go out to our server, get a GET request, and then get some content back. That is probably the most basic server client model 
possible out there. And this works fine for maybe a few users and whatever this server is scaled to accept that number of users. I would be pretty surprised if this server could handle anything more than 100x concurrent users. So very important you understand just the most basic thing. We have a user here and the user makes a web request, be it via a web browser or their mobile app to the DNS. The DNS returns us an IP address to the user. The user's browser then can use that to come back over here to the server. The server then returns that request to the user here. Now, one thing that we could do to make this even better is add on to the server here a database. Now, this database for this web application would then be able to store whatever user state and be able to retrieve it later in the instance that the server crashed. So if the server restarted itself, we wouldn't be storing state in raw memory on the server, but rather we'd be storing it on disk with the database. Now this database could be a NoSQL or a relational database like MySQL or something. That's really up to you to discuss with your interviewer for what makes sense for this application. Let's say that this application is some kind of zoo application. I usually like to go with the, uh, the zoo analogy. And at this point, you would really also want to talk with your interviewer about what requirements the zoo might actually have. So let's say that it has any number of animals and it has employees and it has visitors. Personally, I think a relational database makes most sense to me. So we're going to my SQL this thing. That way we can have relations between animals and maybe certain employees that take care of those animals. And then maybe even visitors who really like certain animals or have some sort of relationship with the employees. Relational databases are really powerful. They're a little more complicated, but you need to be able to talk about these things and the trade-offs they give with this certain application and this stack. So then what might a return request here actually look like back to the user? Let's say that they're doing some kind of get request on zebras. So yeah, this is a get request on a zebra. That might be some kind of JSON that gets returned. Maybe the animal has a name. Maybe the animal has a location, all this stuff. So this is stuff that's getting returned back to the client. And really what I'm talking about here is some kind of zoo API. And you see, I'm trying to kind of have a conversation, I guess, really with myself, about what this system is, some of the assumptions that I'm having about the system. And let's say that the person I'm being interviewed by wanted to pivot this. They may ask me, oh no, well, we really don't want this to be an API. We want this to be some kind of zoo video streaming service. How then would you do that? Well, I think maybe I would reconsider what kind of requests were coming back to the user Really, a JSON payload makes no sense. Probably rather it would want to be some kind of web socket that could stream video back to the client user. And again, it's really important that you don't get too deep into the nitty gritty. We're talking about these things at a high level. I would maybe even say that talking about JSON responses would be a little bit too nitty gritty unless you're really diving into what that API might actually look like. This is just the system at a high level. So one last time, user makes a request that gets forwarded to DNS. DNS then returns the IP back to the user. User's web browser makes that request to the server, server back to the user with the request. And again, this won't really scale. So how can we start to scale this thing? One thing we can do is start to break out the database away from the server and host the database rather in its own server instance. Now the database then can talk with our server that's doing all the application logic and stuff, and it can be written back to the database back and forth. Now this gives us the ability to start thinking about scaling the database as a separate entity from the server. And this brings me to an interesting point that you're gonna hear a lot about, and that's vertical scaling versus horizontal scaling. Now, what vertical scaling is, you think of about up and down, is how you might scale an individual server, be it its memory, its CPU, its disk, whatever. This is just making that single server more powerful or less powerful if you're scaling it down vertically. This is usually a good option early on when you're trying to scale things. 
because it's pretty cheap and efficient to scale things vertically versus trying to redesign a whole system and re-implement something to allow for horizontal scaling. So what is horizontal scaling? You can think of it down this way. Horizontal scaling is adding additional servers. So if we scale this way, we're adding server two, we're adding server three, and this makes things more complicated because now if we've scaled up to three servers, all three of these have to be able to talk to each other, however way that you would design that to actually talk to each other. And horizontal scaling leads to a really interesting point, is you have to design for scaling. Design for scaling. It can be really easy to lock yourself into a single server instance where horizontal scaling is challenging. And you have to redesign so many different things to make horizontal scaling doable. So again, vertical scaling, you're scaling just a single server instance and horizontal scaling, you're going sideways, you're adding server instances, going from one to two to three servers, and those have to be able to talk to each other and coordinate amongst themselves. Okay, so this is sort of where we're at with our system. We have user, goes to DNS, gets the IP, can make a GET request, gets a JSON response, and our server can read write to a separate database instance running on a separate server somewhere. So now we've scaled up, basically splitting up our server, which is doing the application logic, and the actual database instance itself. And we can actually start to scale this database and do some interesting things with the database here. Now, I just added another database here and another one here. And there's lots of different ways that we can start to get these to talk to each other and work with each other. Look out for the video that's gonna be about database scaling. That's a whole other topic that I think is worth revisiting in its own video. But I think probably one of the most common, arbitrary, easy to understand ways to think about this is have the server read write to each database instance. That way we've essentially replicated our data across three different instances. So why is this important? Well, if one database goes down and crashes and dies and isn't available, which trust me happens, then we can still read write to two of the other databases. Our application isn't down. We haven't lost user data. It's been replicated across to two other instances. Now this creates interesting problems on the read write side from the server as well. Now we have to have logic to include reading and writing to all the databases it can know about, add configurations in there as well. But one thing we can do to make this a little easier and even allow for scaling even more is in here, in this kind of section here, is add a load balancer. Now what a load balancer will give us is essentially this is another server that can handle reading and writing to the multiple databases with a single connection from the server. So instead of the server itself having to read and write to each connection to the database, we can have that handled by a load balancer where the server application who's doing the application logic just has to read and write to the load balancer and the load balancer can distribute that among the many databases we may have. Again, this warrants a whole nother video to talk about database scaling and how you can do different kinds of ways to ensure that data is replicated and doing it fast and doing it efficiently. That video will be coming in this series as well. So if you notice here in our architecture, we're still really only on one individual server. So we wanna be able to scale that as well. One thing we can do, just like we added a load balancer here, is we can add a load balancing layer here that will enable us to add additional servers that then can all read write to the load balancing databases down here. So let's add that in right here. Now you may be asking yourself, but John, what are like the pros and cons of the load balancer and why would you wanna do this? Why would you wanna scale up to the multiple servers? I do think that there are some things that are just kind of a given. There's not really too many cons I can think of behind scaling your actual servers, scaling your databases, for example. These are things that if you want to scale to a million users, you just gotta kinda do. So really the pros, database, it's gonna be extremely available. Data is gonna be durable. We're not gonna lose data when one of the databases goes down. 
scaling our actual servers up here, well, then we can handle more users. We just scaled up to two users, so now we can handle 2x the number of users that previously were coming in. I think another thing at this point we can start to think about is actually decoupling the users from the servers themselves. This way they will be completely stateless and then we can have a much easier time scaling them up. Now, usually what this means is offloading some of the user session tokens or user specific stuff onto disk memory. So that will mean another read write and sometimes what I've seen things happen is an actual read write to a separate database system. So I'm just gonna put this in a square. This could be a totally separate scaling thing that will handle user session stuff. So now since we have this here, this automatic user session uh, decoupling is we can actually auto scale over here. So now our servers can automatically scale up and scale down as we need as user traffic is coming in because they're completely stateless. They're not tied to any user sessions. They're not tied to anything that might prevent them from coming down to block users from using the service. And this is really something that modern application stacks like Kubernetes give us is the ability to easily scale up and scale down as needed, but your server application logic has to be stateless. So we can offload that state onto databases and a database system down here. So things are getting more complicated. Things are starting to scale up. Now, really, we can scale our server stack to infinity. We can scale it as many people as we need since it'll auto scale up and down as users come to use our service. Another thing we can start to do for the user here, and this is kind of, in my opinion, a nice to have, but really worth talking about is a content delivery network. And really all a content delivery network is, is a service that you can use in most public clouds to offload some of your images or common assets that you don't wanna to have to constantly be serving to users. That's just more load that you're having to handle as you're serving images and the same banner over and over and over again. Now, usually these content delivery networks are like extremely fast. So this can help you scale your web applications really quickly by offloading some of those common assets to a content delivery network. A content delivery network probably also warrants its own video, so look out for that as well. Now, I think it's worth noting here for a content delivery network to talk about some of the cost benefits that you get. Content delivery networks, since like I said, they're run by most public third-party clouds, can be extremely expensive. And yes, cost can be a huge consideration you make in your system design interviews because companies wanna save money and companies wanna do stuff efficiently. And oftentimes that also means cost efficiently so they can make a bottom line. Another thing to consider is, well, what happens if this thing fails? What if my assets aren't actually returned here? How in the world will I have a fallback? Let's say that that happens. You need to have a fallback from the server over here, essentially. And you need to make that consideration because that stuff does happen. Even if it is from Google Cloud or AWS, content delivery networks can fail. Okay, moving right along. Our system is scaling. We're getting up there. We have auto scaling with our servers. We have some nice scaling and replication in our databases. And I think at this point, we can sort of start to think about scaling even higher by taking this entire stack here and replicating it across many data centers. And so we would take this whole stack, we would put it kind of into some kind of bundle, and this could really become its own data center. And you can see here that the entrance and exit for that data center would be its own load balancer. And these data centers could then load balance across many different regions, which gives us even more scalability and more durability. Let's say that I had a data center in US East 2 and West 2 and 1 in Europe. Let's say that West 2 went down. Well, I still have this one available and this one available. Let's say all of the United States data centers went down, which would be terrible. Well, we still have the EU one and things would probably be chugging pretty slowly with just one data center. But we could have some kind of load balancing system that would forward requests to available data centers. That way, we're not losing users and they can still access our service successfully. So now we're scaling to the point of total regions with entire data center stacks. We basically have taken this entire thing, put it into its own sort of containerized thing and made it its own data center. 
I think also at this point, it's really worth talking about observability. You have to be able to look into these things and have knowledge about what's going on, how many resources are being used, what kind of time it's taking to return requests for your services, all that stuff. So each of these things, the load balancer, the database stack, maybe the user session database, the servers especially, the load balancers, yeah, those all have to return some kind of metrics. And then those metrics can be used in some other separate server running some kind of observability stack. Today, really the hot thing for that is Grafana Prometheus. And that's what I'm most familiar with, which is why I'm bringing it up. But you need to be able to look into your stack, be able to look at how it's doing, how fast it's returning things. And giving each of your applications and exposing those metrics is really, really important. So at this point, we have data centers, we have observability, and we can scale these data centers up and down. But this brings its own sort of cost benefit as well. And we really have to be considerate of how we approach this. You can start to end up with a lot of data drift, uh, I like to call it, where maybe a user is constantly getting access to US East 2 and they're writing all their data there. We have to have a way to have eventual consistency across all of our data centers, no matter how we scale those data centers up. Because we've decoupled our servers from our user sessions, we can't be assured that users are always gonna be connecting to the same data center all the time. So that again is another really, really huge difficult problem. But essentially we need another write layer. This is gonna come all the way over here. We need another read write layer. That's gonna be some kind of centralized database system. And probably at this point, we would get rid of this layer here, come outside of our actual data centers, and instead have that again hosted outside. And these things would be their own scalable, reliable systems in themselves that are completely decoupled from our own data centers. That way, if a data center here went down, we could be reasonably assured that the data is also replicated here and then our user sessions aren't lost here as well. This would also include a layer that would reliably write data back to our databases so that we could have consistency across all of our data centers. I know this is kind of getting to be a mess, but you can always think of this database here as the, the manager, and it will write data consistently back to our data centers that way we are always assured that we have the same data across all our data centers and that all the data that's getting written in our data centers themselves can get written back to our manager. At this point, there's even more that you could do to scale it even further. You could add in a caching layer for your data. You could add in some kind of messaging system like Rabbit to enable distributed fast memory that could be shared across all the data centers. And there's even more stuff that you could start to do with scaling your data and your servers. You could start to go serverless. There's all kinds of things that you can start to do. But really at this point, I would say we're at the point where we could probably scale to a million users. But again, let's go back to the basics. I hope this video showed you that you wanna look at stuff from a high level, be prepared to pivot if possible and talk about any of the options and also have that conversation. Having that conversation, I think, is extremely important in any of your software engineering interviews. You want to talk about trade-offs, cost benefits of things. This is extremely important. And really, this goes into just scaling. How do you scale? How do you scale efficiently? How do you scale cost efficiently, but also in ways that's going to be fast and good for the users? Next, you got to know about the tech. We didn't talk about specific tech a lot in this video, but that's going to be a separate one where we kind of give a broad overview of some of the different things that you will want to talk about in your system design interviews. And then practice. Practice makes perfect. You're not going to be doing this every day. I don't even do this every day where I think about system designs and stuff, but it is a really important skill to have. Shows that you can talk about things at a very high level and think about whole complicated systems and design them from scratch. So check out part two coming very soon. Thank you everybody for watching and subscribing, like, commenting, all that stuff. I really appreciate everybody. Thank you so, so much. This was John with John Codes. I will catch you guys next time. Peace.